song people doing their concerts. Hello, New York. We love you. We love you. I don't know how they can love so many places. Okay. Um, uh, first of all, I want to thank Ann, and I want to thank CIA for all that they do. This is exactly what John Paul has asked us to do. He wants us to be he wants us to be evangelists, and this is a very good way of doing that. But you, by the way, I hope you don't. I'm not going to be playing anything. <laughs> I, you can imagine when my, I come home one day and my wife says, I got a call from the CIA. <laughs> what did you do now? <laughs> so it was kind of interesting and it's, everything has worked out very well. I got to the hotel today. The code for the Wi-Fi is 1212. Is that amazing? amazing. <laughs> so life is full of these kinds of things. Life is full of all these little God moments, right? No such thing as a coincidence. We're going to talk about a lot of those today, a lot of those this evening. So um, let's let's get started. What we're going to talk about is a story about a woman, a man, and a flower, a beautiful, miraculous flower, all of which culminates in the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe. In order to actually do it justice, we're going to have to talk a little bit about the prophecy of the apparition. The prophecy actually started in the year 40 AD. 40 AD. And it continued as a prophecy all the way through 1492. In 40 AD, Our Lady appeared to St. James. All right, so we're going to talk about that. We're going to give you that information. We're then going to talk a little bit about the history of Mexico, the Aztecs and Cortes, the apparitions of Our Lady, how that all occurred in Mexico as we know it today, and then finally the image of Our Lady. It's the image itself and the science behind the image. You know, today everybody says, oh, science is more important. Science, you have to prove it with science. This has been proved with science. It's incredible the story that you're going to hear. And then we'll finish up with some of the miracles associated with the image, and it's only a little taste of them. So that's going to be our agenda for this evening. Our Lady of the Pillar, first century, 40 AD. St. James is in the Iberian Peninsula. He's in Spain. He's in a town called Saragossa, named after Caesar Augustus. That's the area that he decided to go and evangelize as an apostle. Jesus said, go out to the corners of the earth, evangelize, right? convert, share the gospel, spread the good news. He went to the Iberian Peninsula. And I say this with all love for my, my brother, effectively, my good friend. He's like a brother to me, Juan Landa. But the Spanish can be a little tough sometimes, right? The Spanish can be a little tough, but he found it. I, he was discouraged. Why aren't these people jumping up and down at what we're telling them? Here, a man resurrected from the dead. And he was a little discouraged, and he's on the banks of the river, and he's got his 12 disciples, and he's uh, talking about how, what are we going to do, what are we going to do? Angels bring Our Lady to him. She is carried by the angels. They put a pillar in the ground. They stand her on the pillar, and she's holding an image of herself with the baby Jesus. And she looks down at St. James. Now the pillar, they've tried to find out how deep that pillar is and they can't measure how deep it is. It goes beyond what they can measure. And that pillar is still there in Saragossa, Spain, in the Basilica of Our Lady of the Pillar. And she looks down at St. James and she probably says something along the lines in today's vernacular, Jimmy, take a pill. <laughs> you know, ease up on yourself, ease up on yourself. But in that discussion, she says, these people will do great things for my son. These people will do great things for my son. So she's telling him about the future. Well, what is it they're going to do? We'll talk about that. In Extremadura, Spain, let's go there next. In year 599, or just before then, St. Leander was the Bishop of Seville. And St. Leander did such a marvelous job in converting the Visigoth kings to Christianity 
that Pope Gregory gives him a statue of Our Lady that was carved by St. Luke. And he takes the statue and he puts it in the cathedral in Seville. And it stays there for over 100 years. Now, when the Muslims started coming in, when Islam and the Moors, and the, when they started to come into the European continent, to conquer the European continent, right, they would come in and they would destroy all the churches and they would desecrate all the statues. And the Spanish knew that and they always, when they went to battle, had an image of Our Lady with them. And if they were going to lose the battle, they would take the image and they would bury it or hide it. In this case, they knew the armies were coming, they knew they weren't going to be able to resist it, and so they took the statue that was given to St. Leander, they put it in a trunk with all of the appropriate documentation, and they ran out of the city with it. And when they got to this bank of a river, they decided to bury it there. And they did. And then everybody dispersed, and it was lost for centuries. In 1326, Gil Cordero, which in Spanish is land, like the land, it's kind of an interesting connection there. Gil Cordero is a farmer and a shepherd and a, and, and a farmer. He's got cows and sheep and whatnot. And he was starting to get visions of our lady. And one day, he's out on the, in the field with his prize cow, and the prize cow drops dead. Right there in front of him. And he's very distraught. What am I going to do? This is my prize cow. <laughs> Our lady appears to him. The cow comes back to life and she says, go and get the priests. Come here and dig here and you'll find an image of me. So he did. He went to the priests. They knew him as a good and pious man. They come back and they dig and they find the trunk in which was the beautifully preserved image of Our Lady, which is then called um, uh, a, a shrine right there built in what is called Extremadura, Spain. And it was Our Lady uh, of Guadalupe. Why Guadalupe? Because it was a Guadalupe River. So it's not the Guadalupe that we know here in the New World, but it was the same name because it was along the river, the Guadalupe River. The statue does not look anything like what we know is Our Lady of Guadalupe. But in the same shrine, in one of the side chapels, is the statue of the Immaculate Conception, which is very, very old. And it looks amazingly like the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe from Tepeyac, from Mexico. This became one of the most famous shrines in all of Spain. Extremadura, Spain, Our Lady of Guadalupe. All of the generals, any of the navigators, the admirals, the priests and the, and, the, and the bishops, the kings and the queens, they would all go there to pray. And this all began in 1326. In 1485, the new kings and queen of Spain, we all remember Ferdinand and Isabella, first time that a king and a queen had equal power, you know that, First time in the world that a king and queen had equal power. One was not subservient to the other. They were equal. They were very faithful Catholics. And they were doing a retreat in Extremadura, Spain, at the monastery. Who's in attendance at the retreat but Christopher Columbus? Now, despite what you hear, Christopher Columbus was a beautiful man. He was a third order Franciscan, and he often wore a habit, a Franciscan habit. Not the kind of person that the press and history would like to think he is, and there's much evidence that history is going to be changed here soon, like a lot of history that we learned growing up that could not be substantiated anymore, and the new historians are going back and correcting this. So in any event, he's at this He's at this retreat, and during the retreat, he has the opportunity to share with the king and queen about his desire to act on an inspiration he got while re reading Isaiah and the prophecy that you should go to the corners of the earth to spread the good word. 
And he took that upon himself as a navigator, as a challenge, that I was being inspired to do this. His idea, after having, as he writes in his diary, a vision from a woman, Mary, says, you can go west, and you'll be there. He knew that Mar Marco Polo had gone the eastern route, and they loved Marco Polo and what he was bringing and telling them about Christianity. They actually sent requests to the Pope saying, please send more missionaries. And for whatever reason, the Pope was unable to do that. So Christopher Columbus says, I'm going to find a new road, and it's going to be less dangerous, and we're going to be able to go and bring to the east, via the western route, we're going to bring these missionaries and help spread Christianity to people who have not yet had an opportunity <coughs> to understand and experience Christianity. <clears throat> Didn't say nothing about a trade route. This is all documented. You can look this up. It's actually documented in um, government uh, Spanish historical information and uh, records. And it, it talks all about this. So he tells them of this, and they say, you know what? We, we want to find more souls. We want to spread Christ to the world. So we'll be happy to support you. We'll fund you, but we have to wait until we're finished expelling, all of our money is expelling the Islam from the peninsula, from the Iberian Peninsula. We're reuniting Spain, we're recapturing everything, and we're expelling the infidel. And it was, and he agreed, so he had to just sit and wait. In January of 1492 was the final battle in Granada when the Sultan of the Islam Islamic army, the Moors, surrendered and agreed to leave, uh, leave the Iberian Peninsula. And so they did. And then Christopher Columbus was contacted and let's get going. 1492, let's get going. So he immediately comes to Spain. He finds the three best ships he could find. Anybody remember the names of the ships? You notice how you say that. Everybody says it the same way. The Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. Which was the flagship? The flagship was the Santa Maria. When you talk about armadas, when you talk about fleets, you always put the flagship first. But in this case, it just has always been the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. But when you take those names, and you translate them into English, the Spanish would understand this because it's in their native tongue, but in our native tongue, in English, it's the girl paints Holy Mary. The girl paints Holy Mary. And what happened when she came and appeared in Mexico, in Tepeyac, on the hill? She left us an image of herself. She effectively painted a picture of the girl. She appeared as a 15-year-old girl, and she gave us an image of herself, so the girl painted Holy Mary. So this is all part of the prophecy of the second most significant event in the history of the world. The first being passion, death, and resurrection of our Lord. And when you think about the impact of this, it is the second most significant event in the world. So that's the prophecy there. When you go and you look at all of this, you can see Christopher Columbus' log book, the three ships, and now he's ready. He goes to the islands off the coast of the Iberian Peninsula. He's in the mouth of the uh, bay, and he's waiting to leave. He's filled the boat with everything that he needs for the voyage. All of their provisions are ready, and he's now waiting. He has to have wind. He was told the winds would take him. Wait for the winds. He waited six days. And finally, on September 8th, the winds arrived, the birthday of Mary. And he starts sailing west. And every night at dusk, the entire crew would come on to the deck of the ships, the three ships, and together they would sing the Salve Regina. Sounds like a guy that's ready to go and annihilate people, right? Just exterminate them. Not at all. He's looking for souls for Christ. They sing the Salve Regina every night. About halfway through, 
All of the, the, the crew was getting nervous. This is taking so long. We never see anything but water. What if this is wrong? What if this can't be done? And he said to them all, I have calculated our provisions. If we don't find land by the Feast of Our Lady of the Pillar, right, by the Feast of Our Lady of the Pillar, we'll have enough provisions to turn around and go back. So be patient. Shortly after, the winds die. And so now he gets the oars and they're rowing. They're rowing westward. And one night when they're on the deck, singing the Salve Regina, a flaming branch falls from the sky. Now, was it a comet, a falling star, who knows, whatever. But in his mind, it was a flaming branch. And he decided that was a sign from God, and he's now going to go in that direction. So the next morning, when they get ready to start, they, lift the, they start rowing in that direction, and about halfway through the day, he catches the winds that start taking him west again. So now he is going towards what ended up being the new land, the new world. He sights land on October 11th. Now what do we celebrate on the 1st of January? The, the mother of God, Theotokos, right? The mother of God, Mater Dei. Mater Dei, mother of God, January 1st. We didn't always do that. Anybody remember what it used to be? The circumcision. Very good. The feast of the circumcision. The octave of Jesus' birth is when he was circumcised. And that's when he had the feast of the circumcision. But in 19, I, I forget now, the year 69 or 79, they changed the liturgical calendar and they moved the feast of Theotokos to January 1st from October 11th. October 11th, Mater Dei. And so, they leave on her birthday, they sight land on the Feast of the Mother of God, and they actually land on October 12th, which is? Not then. <laughs> Wasn't Columbus Day back then. It was then and is now the Feast of Our Lady of the Pillar. The Feast of Our Lady of the Pillar. Full service. From 40 to the time that they landed, the Feast of Our Lady was covered. Very much a part of the prophecy. Now, the Aztecs. Let's talk a little bit about the Aztecs. The Aztecs came probably around the turn of the millennium. They were all from an island off the west coast of Mexico called Aslan. And they were growing so rapidly they were using up all of the resources. So they needed to begin to migrate. So they come to the mainland, and this legend developed that they should continue to roam, continue to migrate until they found a place where there was a bush. And in the bush would be an eagle, and in the eagle's claw and beak would be a snake, which today is the center of the flag of Mexico. Right? An eagle on a bush with a claw in its beak and its, and, uh, I mean a, a snake in its beak and its claw. And they did that. They migrated down the west coast of Mexico. They started moving inland. And when they got to the center, what we now know today as Mexico City, okay, they called it Tenochtitlan. When they got there, there was a marshy area, a very big lake. It was actually two lakes, a saltwater lake and a freshwater lake. And in the middle of the lake, not too far from shore, was a little island. And on the island was a bush. And on the bush, there was an eagle. And it had a snake, a serpent in its claw and in its beak. They decided, this is where we're going to land. This is where we're going to stay. And so they stayed there. And they developed their civilization. They were very, very smart. They had a calendar as easily as uh, detailed and accurate as the Mayan calendar, except theirs lasted only 52 years. And they believed that if the gods were happy, they would get another 52 years, otherwise it would be the end of the world. They were very good with uh, astrology and mathematics. 
but they never discovered or invented the wheel. So they did everything with porters and slaves. And what they did was, in this center where this island was, they started taking lava rock from the many volcanoes that surrounded the area, and they put the lava rock in the water to separate the salt water from the fresh water lake, and that way they could have clean fresh water, and they built causeways that came to the center. Around the time of Mary's apparition, around the time of Cortez's arrival, there were over 20 million people that lived in that area. 15 million of them were controlled by the Aztecs, and 300,000 of them lived on this island in the center. So a very established, a very uh, complete kind of culture. In around 1403 to 1407, the emperor of the Aztecs died. He had two sons, Montezuma and Tlaxcala, and one of them had to become emperor. Montezuma was the warrior, handsome, imposing. Tlaxcala was the brains. Guess who got elected? <laughs> Montezuma gets elected emperor. But Tlacoel says to him, you name me high priest. And he knew that he would have more influence being the high priest than he would be as the emperor. He in fact lived to past 90 years old, and he selected the next three emperors. And through him they developed this religion, they developed this culture that was really kind of crazy. They had festivals that were marked with human sacrifices. Every year, roughly 50,000 people were sacrificed. They, would, they were so powerful as warriors, they would have fake wars with all the tribes around them. The other tribes did not like to hate them. Because instead of coming, they'd say, we could come and annihilate you. But we need victims for our sacrifices. So we're just going to come, we're going to make believe we're having a war, we're going to capture the people that we want, and then we're going to go back, and we're going to sacrifice them. And they would have them, they would put them in these cages, and they'd feed them, and then they would get ready for sacrifice. And when it was their turn, they would bring them out, they would give them some pulque. Pulque is the fermented juice of the cactus plant, the gay cactus. Give them some of that, and then they would be kind of a little loopy. They wouldn't bite so much, and they would walk them up to the top of their temple, which we call the pyramids, right, in Mexico, but that's their temple. They'd walk them up to the top, and there would be a four, four, three, four stone, and four priests would hold them back over this stone, and the, another priest would take the obsidian stone, which they could break, and it would crack, so it was a very sharp edge. They would open up the chest, pull out the heart while it's still beating, hold it up to everybody, and on the top of the temple was a stone bowl, they would put it in there. And their belief was that the birds would be sent by the gods to take the heart, and it would be taken to the gods so that the gods could eat the heart. The rest of the body was tossed down the back of the temple, and priests down there would dismember the body and give it to nobility, to administrators, to soldiers and warriors to eat. Because they felt they got the strength from those people that they ate. So they were cannibals. They had two main gods that did this, that they did this for. Huitzilopochtli, Huitzilopochtli, the lover of hearts and the drinker of blood, and Tezcatlipoca, the tenter at the shoulder, the smoking mirror, the lord of darkness. These kind of ring a bell? Never before, never since, had there been a culture so perfectly aligned with satanic symbols, words, and culture. The culture of death. And that's what was going on in Mexico at the time of the apparition, just prior to the apparitions. Their symbols were the feathered serpent. Their gods lived in the moon. 
right in the crescent moon in particular. Clark Hallel and Montezuma, again, we talked about those guys and the 50,000 sacrifices a year. In 1487, Montezuma was long gone, Montezuma II was there now. In, in 1487, they completed the construction of these two temples right there in the center, brand new temples. And they wanted to dedicate those temples, and it was right at the end of their 52 year calendar. Clark Kalel wanted to show his strength. So, in four days, every 15 seconds, 24 hours a day, they sacrificed 80,000 human beings, men, women, and children, even their own, from their own area, from their own people, because they wanted the gods to be happy about these two new temples. Horrible situation. That's what the Aztecs were all about. Storybooks don't want to tell us that, but that's what was going on at the time. <clears throat> at one time, there was a priest that tried to tell them to do something different. Quetzalcoatl. Quetzalcoatl, dressed in black, as all their priests would be dressed in black, would tell them that the true God is a good God. He's not looking for sacrifice. He thinks that we should be good to each other, that we should, be, we should love each other, we should help each other. He was banished from Mexico. That's what was called Mexico. He was banished from Mexico. But a prophecy developed that he would return. And when would he return? Well, their calendar was so detailed that they knew the exact day that he would come back. Because his name, Quetzalcoatl, <coughs> translated to the first year of the reed on the ninth day of the wind, which was April 22nd, 1519. And when he came back, he was going to reclaim the empire and rule all of Mexico. Well, in 1509, Princess Papinson, sister of Montezuma II, fought dead, or so they thought. They put her in a cave and they were mourning her. Turns out she was in a coma. She came alone and she came running out and she told them, I had a dream. I had a dream that these white men with beards were coming. And they were going to come on boats that I've never seen boats so big. These canoes are so big. And in the middle was a tree. And on the tree they had this big cloth. And on this cloth there was a symbol. And they had that same symbol on their helmets. And they were going to come and they were going to take over the empire. The symbol was the cross. He was very, very, very superstitious. So he started sending out people to watch, to see any waterway, if there was a possibility that this god, Quetzalcoatl, would be coming back. Maybe it was him. Maybe it was these other men that were coming over to take over. Well, as it turns out, on the very day that Quetzalcoatl was supposed to return, <coughs> in comes Hernan Cortez. And because it was Good Friday, Hernan Cortez wore his black armor which made him look like a priest. And they landed in Veracruz. <coughs> and they got off the boat, and with them they took their horses. Now the local people knew they were horses because they saw pictures of them, but they had long been extinct from the Americas. So they saw, here comes God. Here come the gods on their horses. And they're coming here. So. They were very nervous, so they kept a good watch on them. April 22, 1519. As he's moving inland, a, in Chintla, Mexico, they actually have a battle. They, they're attacked. They win the battle against that odds, 300 to 1 odds. And why would that be? Well, first of all, if the word got out, people are thinking they're gods, so they might be a little bit nervous about battling them. But also, they spent centuries fighting off Islam in Spain. So their fighting skills were exceptional. Plus, they had cannons, which were unheard of here. So against uh, bad odds, they end up winning. And the, and the chief gives his daughter, he had a daughter that he didn't like very well. And so he gave her as a gift. 
She happened to have, very providential, she happened to have a gift for languages. So she learned Spanish very well, and she stayed with Cortez for the rest of her life, and was a translator, and so introduced him to the various tribes. Eventually, they get to Montezuma, they get to the area where Montezuma is, and they meet him. And he's on the way finding out about all these people who are being killed, all these sacrifices. And he finally gets up, he tells me, he says, this has got to stop. My God is telling me we have to stop this needless human sacrifice. And Montezuma responds by saying, I'm sorry, but we have to actually kill you, my God tells me. So Cortez arrests Montezuma in his own palace and keeps him under house arrest. That continues back and forth, back and forth, but eventually uh, in November of, of 1521, there are three days worth of battles, and on day one, they sent 3,000 people, uh, Aztecs, to go and fight about 1,100 of uh, the Spanish, and the Spanish win. On day two, they sent 6,000 to fight them, and the Spanish win again. On day three, they sent 50,000 warriors and the Spanish win again. They actually captured the economic center of the area. Montezuma was mortally wounded, and that was the end of the Aztec Empire. Now, Spain is going to be sending over Franciscans. So they know they're going to do this. The Franciscans, it takes three years to get them there. 1524, they arrive. And they're led by Zumada, prior Zumada. Why Zumada? Well, Charles was the king, and he knew he needed somebody who was going to be a good leader of the Franciscans. He also knew that the people that were going to be rewarded for helping them out with the, their wars against Islam weren't always the nicest group of people, that nobility. But they were going to get land and become governors. And so he wanted to send somebody over that he could trust to take care of the local people. Years before, he had gone to a lady of Guadalupe in Extremadura, Spain. He was so impressed with that shrine, he left a big sum of money. About three or four months later, he starts getting word from all these people, probably jealous people, but people saying, hey, that priest we gave that money to, he didn't spend a nickel on the shrine. He gave it to all the poor people that were around there. He didn't use a dime for the you know, shrine. Well, that impressed him. So when it came time to pick someone to go over there, he picked Zumari. Okay, And so they came in 1524 uh, and uh, started, to do their, started to do their evangelization. Princess Pattinson actually got baptized in 1525. Juan Diego and his wife, Maria Lucia, were married and baptized. Juan and Maria regularly traveled 15 miles on a Saturday to get religious education and then mass, the vigil mass on Saturday evening. 15 miles. Tell that to your kids and your grandkids when they complain about getting driven. <laughs> right? 15 miles every week. However, Maria gets sick and dies in 1529, and Juan Bernardino, Juan moves in with his uncle, Juan Bernardino. Now they're only nine miles from the place where he goes. And he goes there every week. He was a map maker by trade. See him here and his wife and his uncle, just a, a depiction from an artist. And now it's 1531, and it's December. Just like now. Not quite as cold as here, but it gets cold. Very high elevation. Well, a lot of people think, oh, I don't want to go to Mexico in the summer, it's so hot. Well, it's hot if you're going to the beach, you're going to the shore. Mexico City, the average temperatures, the average high temperatures in Mexico City, in the places like when we go there on pilgrimage, are 72, 73 degrees. It's beautiful because of the high elevations. Well, those high elevations, make it cold in those high elevations at night. So there's a frost that time of year. 
Well, on December 9th, which back then in the Julian calendar was the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, you know, moved to December 8th when the Gregorian calendar took over. So on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, he's on his way and he's passing by this hill called Tevia. And he hears this incredible music. And he hears singing. And he hears birds. He's saying, I, can, I don't hear this, that pretty in the summertime. What's going on here? And all of a sudden it stops. And he hears, Juanito. Somebody's calling me. Johnny. Juanito's like, Johnny. Juanito. Come here, Juanito. And he goes up to the top of the hill. And while he's, when he gets to the top of the hill, he sees a beautiful image of our, our lady. She's standing on a bush, and everything that she's standing above has turned to gold and gems and, and diamonds. It's just spectacularly beautiful. He can tell that this is something special, and he drops to his knees. And Our Lady speaks to him. And you need to get these and read the entire conversation that they have. It's like such beautiful poetry. But what she says to him, Juanito, know for certain, least of my sons, that I am the perfect and perpetual Virgin Mary, mother of the true God, through whom all things, I'm sorry, mother of the true God, through whom everything lives, the Lord of all things near and far, the master of heaven and earth. It is my earnest wish that a temple be built here to my honor. Here I will demonstrate, I will exhibit, I will give all my love, my compassion, my help, and my protection to the people, to all the people here united in this land. I am your merciful mother. The beginning of mercy that we celebrate so much with the divine mercy that our Lord has brought us through St. Faustina. I am your merciful mother, the merciful mother of all of you who live united in this land and of all mankind, of all those who love me, of those who cry to me, of those who seek me, of those who have confidence in me. Here, I will hear their weeping, their sorrow, and will remedy and alleviate all their multiple sufferings necessities, and misfortunes. That's how she greets Juan Diego. That is so different than all of her apparitions. Penance, penance, penance. Pray the rosary. Pray the rosary. Here in the new world, she came to the beginning and said, I'm your mother of mercy. Come to me. Share with me your problems. I will console you. Very, very different kind of elevates it above. It's, it's the beginning of what we are learning about mercy if we're willing to accept it. So, he right away says, I'm nobody. You know, she always goes to humble people, right? The, girl, the kids, they're always humble. They're very, do what they, they, they believe right away. Imagine, he was 57 years old. He had to be a very humble man, even at 57 years old, because he showed that humility to her, and she picked him, right, to appear to him. And he says, I know why. Ask somebody that's important. No, I'm asking you. Go and tell the bishop. So he agrees, and he leaves, and he goes to tell the bishop. He tells the bishop, and the bishop is very attentive. The bishop listens to every little detail. But he doesn't believe him. And he comes back distraught. Much like St. James. Blessed Mother. He was wonderful. He listened to me. He gave me his time. I waited hours to see him. But he saw me. And he listened. And he understood, but he didn't believe me. He was very grateful. But he asked me to leave. He didn't believe me. She says, OK, go back tomorrow. Ask him again. <laughs> Please, pick anybody. I, I was not successful. Please, I have nobody. 
She said, know that I have many messengers that are very, very powerful that I can send. But it is you that must do this for me. That was the second apparition. He then goes home. Next day, he gets up, he walks the distance again. He goes and he tells the bishop and he tells him the same story. Now the bishop is very attentive again. And he must have been a fan of CSI because he was watching to see if there was any deviations in his story. <laughs> and not a one. He says, well, I, I honestly believe that you believe this. And I believe you saw something. But if she is the mother of God, tell her that I would like to have a sign. She'll know. It won't be a problem. I can't just build a church every time somebody said they saw a vision. But go and ask her. Now he's excited. He's really excited. He runs back. He goes up the hill the next day, December 10th, 497 years ago today. 497 years ago today, he goes back up the hill and he tells her, dear lady, he heard me and he, he, he was excited. He, he told me, bring a sign. Oh, dear lady, please give me a sign that I can bring to him and I know he will do this. She says, I'll come back tomorrow. <laughs> come back tomorrow and I will have the sign for you. So he goes home, the evening of the 10th. And when he gets home, he finds it is Juan Bernardino, his uncle, is deathly ill. And he's caring for him. And he's trying to help him. And he's, you know, taking care of him all night long, trying to keep his fever down. And all through the next day. The next night, he's still caring for him, trying to keep him healthy. And, and finally, Juan Bernardino says, I am going to die. Go and get me a priest. I cannot die without having my viatic without having the opportunity to receive the sacraments before I die, please go and get a priest. So he rushes to go and get a priest. And when he approaches Tepeyac Hill, he thinks, uh-oh, I was supposed to be here yesterday. I forgot all about it, I was sick. Oh, what am I gonna do? She's gonna be so upset with me. She's such a wonderful woman. This, how, can, how can I do this to her? Well, I'll come back later. I'll go around the other side of the hill. So he goes around the other side of the hill, and of course our lady comes down the hill and says, Juanito, where are you going? Where are you going? And he's all excited and upset and said, please, please don't be upset with me. I'm going to get one of your priests to bring to my uncle who is deadly sick. And she says to him, Juan, am I not here or am your mother? Are you not in the fold of my arm? Do I not protect you under my mantle? Your uncle is cured as we speak. Go do as I ask. Go up the hill. And you'll find roses, find flowers. Cut them, gather them, and bring them to me. And when he tells this story, he says, I'm climbing up the hill. And as I'm climbing up the hill, I'm thinking, there are no flowers up in this hill. This hill can't hardly grow stones. But when he gets to the top, he sees all these beautiful varieties of flowers. They're all Castilian roses, red ones and white ones, yellow ones. And they're beautiful. And he cuts them and he gathers them all together and he brings them to her. And she takes them and asks him to hold out his ayate. A-Y-A-T-E, Ayate. They call it a tilly. Same idea. You see pictures of people from Mexico oftentimes, they have long rectangular garment. They tie it around their neck. Rectangular, but all the way down to their toes. Sometimes they wear it over one shoulder. Sometimes they wear it in front. If they're traveling, they'll put it on the ground to sleep in. If they're out gathering crops, they'll hold it up and they'll fill it with crops. Very useful, very utilitarian garment. Well, that's what he had. But he was poor. His was made of the cactus of the fiber, the maguey plant. The maguey cactus, the same ones that they used to get the pulque for the people that were going to be sacrificed. God always takes bad and makes it good, right? Even when good is taken to be used for bad, we get it back as something good. Because that's the way God works. And so, he has his ayate made of 
cactus fiber, not the cotton, like the very rich would have back then. You would have cotton tilmas. He had one that looked just like a tilma. We call it a tilma, but it was actually a mayate, made from this fiber of a vegetable. And he married, puts in a very particular way, these flowers in his ayate, folds up his arms and folds up his arms and says, Go for ye to the bishop and do not let open your arms until you tell him that this is the sign he asked for. So he rushes and he gets to the bishop's residence. And of course, waiting for him are the people who are always outside the bishop's residence. And they're giving him a hard time and they're telling him he's a fool and what are you doing back here again? How do you come you don't take no for an answer, that kind of thing? And when they go to hit him, his arm moves and a flower comes out. And they say, where, where did you get that flowers this time of year? Where did you get those? And they go to grab it. And when they went to grab it, it disappears. And when they pull their hand away, it reappears. Immediately, they turn to each other and say, I think we better go get the bishop. <laughs> so they go and they tell the bishop who sees him right away. He goes in and he tells the story to the bishop about going up and getting the flowers. And at the end, he's done telling him and he drops his hands and all the flowers fall to the ground. And Juan Diego is disappointed. All of this, all of these beautiful flowers, they fall to the ground, and he never even follows it with his eyes to look at the ground. He doesn't look at these beautiful flowers. And when he drops his head, there he sees what the bishop is looking at. It's the image of Our Lady as she appeared to Juan Diego. Beautiful, absolutely stunning. So that was the fourth apparition. And as he's, they immediately put it on the wall, they immediately start to venerate it. Juan Diego is praying with the bishop. And after a while, the bishop says to him, tell me some more. And they start to talk, and he remembers about his uncle. But that Our Lady said his uncle was cured. So he says, take these two men, go back, get your uncle, and bring him here. But stay the night, go the next day. So they go the next day, they get that uh, Uncle Juan Bernardino, they bring him back and he tells them the story of this lady appearing to him. And they ask, when did he, she appear? And the time that he said was exactly the time that Juan Diego was talking to her when she said he would be healed. And she cured him. At the point where she cured him, a spring of water, like so often happens, that is there still today, uh, appeared, healing water. And she said her name was in Nuato, something along the lines of Our Lady of Guadalupe. Now, the interpreter there, who spoke perfect Spanish and perfect Nuato, was in the room at the time, and he indicated that it was Guadalupe, Our Lady of Guadalupe. And of course, the bishop understood that because that's where he was the, the rector of that shrine in Guadalupe, where Our Lady was. And so he accepted that. But in Nuato, the Nuato word for Guadalupe, 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 can't really pronounce it, it's nothing like that, we just can't pronounce those kinds of words, means the woman who crushes the head of the servant in their language. The woman who crushes the head of the servant. And so that are, that's the apparition of Our Lady, those fourth and fifth happening on the 12th of December. This is what it looked like. This is the kind of rose that is there. It's like a velvety red. It's spectacular looking. It's, it's just so beautiful and, and it's a rose and there's different varieties of those roses. This is a picture of the image, but we know this is not correct. We know today that there were 14 people in the room why? Well, as we'll learn later after the break, you can see them in reflections in her eyes. This is an image that was created showing Our Lady curing Juan Bernardino. 
This is actually a crown. It's three-dimensional. This is a two-dimensional painting. This is a three-dimensional crown. What they do in Europe and in Mexico, when people go to an image and they pray and they ask for a miracle, if the miracle is granted and it can be proven, they actually put a crown there so that other people know that a miracle was granted as a result of praying in front of this image so that more people could come and pray and get faith. It was a way of evangelizing. So, the chapel was built in two weeks. Two weeks he built the chapel on the site of the fourth apparition. I think we'll take a break here. We'll have our uh, intermission. When we come back, I'm going to talk about the image. All the different things. This image is alive. And everybody who goes and sees it, they have that sense that it's alive. And I'll tell you why some of the science associated with that after the break. All right? So have a good intermission. Church since I was in the third grade and I joined the choir. I've, I've always loved being involved in the church. But I was kind of going through the motions sometimes, you know? How, you, how that is. You're, you're excited about it, you do it, and you don't always understand why you're doing it, but you embrace it, you do it because it's tradition, it's, 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 it's interesting, it's fun. Well, my wife and I had not been on vacation for a long time. I didn't know anything about Our Lady of Guadalupe as a cradle Catholic. We didn't learn about it in school. I was taught by nuns in New Jersey. We kept the Sisters of uh, St. Elizabeth Ann Seton, you know, the Sisters of Charity, St. Elizabeth Ann Seton. They were my teachers, but I never heard of it. Um, my wife, who was a convert, had a kind of a relationship with Our Lady of Guadalupe. She would be working somewhere and she'd open up a closet and see an image. She was working for the church a lot. So she'd open up a closet and she'd see an image of Our Lady and she'd go, oh, there you are. Why are you in the closet? And talk to the pastor into putting into a prominent place in, in one of the, um, one of the uh, chapels. So she hears on Bellman's radio about this pilgrimage with modern day tours going to, uh, going to Our Lady Guadalupe. And she says, okay, well, I, I'd like to go on that. I says, oh, that's a great idea. I've never been in group travel, didn't think much of it, never did anything on uh, pilgrimage, but all right, we'll do that. As soon as we get done with our our uh, vacation to Italy, which we've been planning for years, we wanted to do this, never got to do it, it's time to do it, we have the time, let's do it now. As soon as we're done with that, she said, no, no, I want to go now. <laughs> well, uh, that's fine, I understand you want to go now, it's exciting, but we won't put it off, we'll do it as soon as we can after we come back from Italy. She goes, well, no, I'm going. <laughs> so, I am a believer of having a good, strong Catholic man. And the basis of all of that is for the man to always, <laughs> under every single condition, always get the last word. <laughs> Most of the time it's yes, dear. <laughs> so I said, yes, dear, we'll go. And so I'm, uh, I'm kind of making fun all the way down. She's, we're flying into Mexico City and she sees the mountains. She's on these beautiful mountains. I said, yeah, but the hills around the sea are probably much nicer. You know, I'm just kind of rubbing it in, not giving her, you know, much leeway. Well, frankly, I thought I was going on vacation with my wife to Mexico. And while I was there, I fell in love with another woman, the Blessed Mother. She captured my heart. That we changed in my life. I never understood, I never knew any of this, and I'm hearing pieces of it. You know, I was so good about telling us and sharing us and bringing us to these wonderful places. Uh, he's the founder of Mater Day Tours. Um, we actually, when we came back, we decided four months later we were going to go again. Forget about Italy, we'll put that off. We're going to go back to Our Lady of Guadalupe. Um, and four months later, I gave up the work that I was doing elsewhere, and I started doing tours with Mata Dei. It just She just captured my heart. Because I didn't understand this. I didn't know it. And I kind of felt personally called on that trip to spread the word, to find out. I came back that first time. I bought every book I could find on it. Sent away for things. I started looking on the internet. I started doing research. And I hate research. But I was doing it, 20, you know, like 10, 12 hours a day sometimes. Everywhere I could go. And I started putting together this information. And I sent a copy of it to uh, Mater Dei Tours to Juan Landa. And I said, you know, if you want to use this, use it. And through this, I started to get to be friends with Juan. And when I went on that second pilgrimage, he asked me if I would start leading pilgrimages. And I said, yes. And I 
I didn't understand why I said yes. That night I said, what am I doing? I mean, I'm crazy. I, I told him I would do this. I have no idea what it means. She said, well, she got into this in the first place. Tomorrow when you go to the shrine, pray before her all day long and see if she can give you the answer. Well, she gave me the answer, and I didn't tell my wife this. This was in 2007. I didn't even tell her this until two years ago. I kept it with me, but I've been placed on my heart that I should start sharing it. So while we're there, I'm praying before the image of our lady, saying, what am I doing? Am I doing the right thing? I don't want this to be me. I don't want it to be prideful. I don't want it to be because I'm, you know, getting in front of people, or I'm talking, or I'm, I'm meeting pilgrimages, and it, it sounds like it's fun, and it's kind of really difficult, but at the same time, it's you're bringing people, you're bringing people to their faith in a deeper way. And I, that's what I wanted it to be about. And while I was there in front of her, in an instant, all of the things of any importance came to me. Every single thing in my life that was important to me flashed before my eyes in an instant. And I heard the Blessed One tell me on my heart, all of this, all of what you thought was you, your successes in school, your successes in work, all of those things, it was all to prepare you for what I'm going to ask you to do now. And so I've been doing this. And this information is available. You can find it as easily as I can find it. A good book to start is, is called um, uh, The Wonders of Guadalupe. It's very simple. It has the basics. There's another one called The Conquest of Mexico, which talks about Cortez more and all of the information that is easily available. And then there's the handbook on, our work, on, uh, on Guadalupe, which is available tonight as one of the handouts. Uh, it, it, it's just amazing stuff. It's easy to find um, because, again, I, I don't really like to do research, but I just kept going at it. The more I found, the more excited I was getting, and the more I was doing. <clears throat> and so I learned about Our Lady of Guadalupe. When, when she came, in the first year, up until the point that she arrived in 1531, the, the Franciscans had been there for seven years, and they did 400,000 baptisms. That's a lot of baptisms in seven years. Right? That's a lot of baptisms. After she appeared, they did 400,000 baptisms in the first year after Our Lady appeared. That's more than a thousand a day. More than a thousand a day. Nine million baptisms in the first ten years. <coughs> in less than 50 years, a hundred percent of Mexico was converted to Catholicism. Never before has it been that complete, that quick. hundred percent. And it was in the mid-1500s when her son, the Catholic Church, the church that he built, lost so many to the Protestant Reformation or Revolution. And nine, we lost five million, and she gained nine million in the New World. Now the apostles were sent out to the world to convert the world, but they were long gone. And the bishops and the priests had responsibilities. The missionaries were doing it, but they were going out to do the best they can. The new world had to be evangelized. Who best to send but the first apostle? The first Christian. Our Lord sent Mary to do it. And she's done a great job. A great job. John Paul knew this. John Paul named her the star of the new evangelization. Now, there's Our Lady of Chesapeake, there's Our Lady of Fatima, which is dear to him. There was uh, you know, Our Lady of Lourdes, Our Lady of Knock he's been to. But he picked her to be the star of the new evangelization because he knew she expects to rally the new world. She expects to rally us to help her re-evangelize the rest of the world through our evangelization, through our leadership. That's her message. We need to be merciful to others by letting them know how important it is to follow what Christ has taught us. She's assembling the armies for the final battles. And she wants you all to be part of it. This is the basilica. I'm going to just run through these. This is the image itself. 
Okay, the Ayate was about six foot one inches. They figured that uh, he was about six foot, Juan Diego. And of course, they make it a little bit longer because when you tie it up, it still should come to your tops of your toes. Uh, when they looked at it, you see this down here? That's the fold in her robe. What does it look like? Anybody guess? The Native Americans used to wrap their babies in a papoose to carry them on their back, right? It's an upside down papoose. See the face here? And wrapped. But it's upside down. The people in the Aztec nation, they didn't have the written word. They didn't have letters to form words. They had pictures. So when they saw Our Lady, they saw a picture. And in that picture, they saw what they believed was the story that was being told. She is stronger than the sun. She blocks out the sun. And the rays seem to emanate from her. She is stronger than the moon. She stands on the moon. The crescent black moon is also the feathered serpent. She's crushing the head of the feathered serpent. Yet, there's someone more powerful than her because her face is in her eyes are looking down in humility. Her hands are folded in prayer. They knew that she was a maiden, that she was a virgin because her hair is straight in their culture when you got married so as not to get anybody in trouble asking you out for a date. When you're married to somebody, they would braid their hair because it was serious trouble if you courted somebody that was already married. So they would braid their hair to show that they were married. Her hair is straight. It shows that she's not. She's a virgin. Yet she has a black sash around her waist, which shows that she's pregnant. She's the pregnant virgin. And above, below the sash, right there, is a four-petaled flower, which the Aztecs believed was the center of the universe and divinity. God is in the center of the universe. God is in her womb. So she is the Virgin Mother of God. They knew this instantly, just by looking at her. Her fingers are spread. I'm sure the Franciscans used that to show that three, you know, a pinky is separated, three persons in one God. If you look over here, it's a little blurry up here on the big screen, but there's a crucifix. This is actually two pieces of the ayate that were sewn together. And right down where the seam crosses her arm, it's a crucifix. Here's the cross piece. Here's the upper body of our Lord, the swaddling wrap there, and his legs coming down to his toes. He's on the crucifix. So this is what it looks like in Mexico. But let's get, let's move on. John Paul, just, he was there six times. They love him in Mexico. He was there six times. And they had this beautiful image. And you can see this image, John Paul's cross. Right? Anytime you see that cross, you think of John Paul. That's what, it, that's what it is. He's the only one that's used that. They've used it a little bit since, but not much. But he's used it all the time. And here's our blessing on right? Our Lady of Guadalupe. See? In his... Well, guess what? The same thing is in Our Lady of Guadalupe. Right here, if you look over here, you can see the cross right below her neck, right on this cross of Columbus, which is also the cross of Cortez, which is also the cross of Constantine, she's wearing. And then right below that, there is this cross. See this black staff and the curve on the top? And it's kind of rugged. That's John Paul Cross. And over here, next to the cross, is a fissure on the knees, toes coming up to the ankles, wearing a L with a cincture on it, the arms reaching up to hold the cross, and the face behind it with the white zucchero. It's John Paul. John Paul too, his on, image is on the breast of Our Lady Guadalupe. 400 and some years before he was even born. So these are images from Mexico. I'm going to skip through those because we have a lot yet to talk about. We talked about uh, part of this image. These here represent the mountains they saw. Right away, they saw the geography that she came to in Mexico. They matched exactly that geography. Okay? She's held up by an angel, and the angel is holding part of the worldly colored or reddish robe, and the 
nobility, the heavenly covered mantle, connecting heaven and earth. She connects heaven and earth. This is what the Aztecs believed right away when they saw it. Uh, uh, face of an adult, a body of a child, we should come to our Lord as children. And yet, no one's been able to explain it. I believe there's a particular significance. If you look at the feathers, how often do you see feathers colored on angels? These feathers are red, white, and blue. And you think of the new world, and you think of red, white, and blue, what's the only thing that comes to mind is the United States. She's calling on us. She's calling on us. She's calling on us to help her, to lead. How do you lead? Evangelize. How do you evangelize? You don't have to get on a soapbox. You don't have to preach on the corners. You live your life like a Christian. Just like in the early days of Christianity. I want to be like them. Look how they love each other. How wonderful will that be? And that's what we're called to do. That's what John Paul wants us to do. That's why he named her the queen and the star of the new evangelization. Now let's talk about the image even more. Her eyes act just as human eyes. You've all heard that there's reflections in the eyes. That's nothing. When you shine light on her eyes, the pupils close. When you remove the light, the pupils open. They dilate just like human eyes. The temperature of the image is always 98.6 degrees. Believe me, the churches aren't at 98.6 degrees. But the image is light on the day, you know, oh, well, let me go back a second. In Mexico, they have a federal district, much like Washington, D.C. Okay? It's now a state, but back then it was a federal district. They called it BFD, right? Mexico FD, federal district. They were the first and the only, I think, if I'm correct, I don't know for sure, but they were the first, for sure, that legalized abortion in Mexico. And it was in November of 2007, if I have my dates right. But regardless, on the day, at the moment they legalized abortion, light emanated from the womb of Our Lady in the shape of a fetus. It was caught on camera, and you can see that on YouTube. Light emanating from that image on the day they utilized the boy. I already talked about the four petal jasmine flower, which represents the fact that she is the mother of God. Tepeyac. You know what the center of the United States is? Anybody know the geographic center of the United States? Kansas. It's a small town in Kansas, about 400, 450 people. I forget the name of the name, but it's, it's they, even though it's an odd shape, the cartographers and the scientists, they know how to figure out what's the exact geographic center. If you include Alaska and Hawaii, it moves up to North Dakota. Right? It moves up to North Dakota. The exact geographic center of the Americas is Tepeyac Hill. She didn't come to Mexico. She didn't come to the Hispanics. They didn't exist then, right? They were, uh, they were being formed at the time. She came to the peoples of the New World. She came to the Americas. She's as much ours as she is the people from Mexico. As you would expect of her. When you look at a picture, as you get closer, it kind of gets sharper. And as you back away, it gets fuzzy. The exact opposite happens. When you're close, it's hard to make out a lot of this stuff. It's when you back away from it that you start to see it. <coughs> Scientists can't figure that out. Photographers can't figure it out. They have never been able to replicate exactly using even digital photography. Something's always different. There's a natural, um, no, I forget the word now, but I will get to it. So the actual ayate, like, is the color of unbleached linen, right? There's no color on the ayate. NASA wanted to do some studies. We gave them the ayate to study. And while they were using lasers, they determined that the colors are floating in midair, 300th of an inch above the material. 
three hundredth of an inch above the material, about the width of a human hair. Not even touching it. This color here is all one shade. This is all one shade. But wait a minute. I see eyes and nose. How could it be one shade? It hovers in midair, the one color, and it picks up the imperfections of the ayate to form the facial features. Yet the facial features remain unchanged in 487 years. The image has defied exact reproduction. The colors actually change when you're viewing it. You'll have two people that they have a, a, a moving walkway, right? And you, and you go just stand still and then move or move your body to keep the people moving. And somebody said, oh my goodness, that's so beautiful, that blue. That's not blue, that's green. You hear them talking? It's like, uh, it, it just changes as you're looking at it. It's like the natural colors of the, of the parrots and, that have, will change colors, but it's done on this ayate. In 1936, the University of Heidelberg was the foremost authority on chemistry, and they determined that the colors here could not possibly have been produced from anything on the face of the earth. No animal, mineral, or vegetable could create those colors. We can do it now with synthetics, but synthetics were not discovered or, or created for 300 years after that. No brush strokes in infrared studies. The stars on Our Lady's cloak were discovered in the 20s to be in the exact order of the constellations on December 12th, the day she appeared. So you can see here, on the right side of the mantle, all of the constellations, Southern Cross, Centaurus, Scorpion, how they all fit in, and then here on the left is the you know, Taurus down at the bottom, the Great Bear, the Herdsman, all of those stars are just as if they were in the sky. A yacht that should last 20 years. They've made replicas of it, and they all disintegrate within 20 years. It's made from vegetable. This is, again, 487 years now. Century of being hung, unprotected, exposed. How many people have been to, how, how many people have been to Italy? Got to the, uh, have you gone to the Sistine Chapel? Recently, John Paul had that cleaned up, right? And they always have these little marks. They leave up there, the little black spots, how bad it was. That's all from incense, and that was only in the 1600s, right? The incense and the, and the, and the uh, candles. And if you have to go to Lourdes, they have to clean the cave every now and then, the grotto, because it gets all black. This never had that. It was uncovered for over 100 years. Exposed to smoke, incense, votive candles, corrosive hydrocarbons, ionization, soot, never ever changed a bit. Touched by millions of hands and lips. You know, you go, you see now, you see, you go to a place uh, uh, where a mass when the Hispanics will come up and they touch and they kiss, right? You go down there and you see it all the time, you go to places in Europe, everybody wants to touch. They actually, in the Holy Land, they cover things and put barbed wire because people want to go and touch and take pieces home with them. It was like that. Recorded over 500 touches in two hours in 1753, and no change to the image. In 1949, they also discovered a human face in the eyes of the lady who turned out to be the head of Juan Diego. When they went to what they call scanning electron microscopes, where they can really go and look at the image, there are 14 people in the room, including the housekeeper, Bishop Dumaradan, the um, the person who was the translator, a family, of course, right? Why would our blessed mother, right? That she wanted a family there. So all of that was there, and all of those people are now, uh, uh, you can see those in certain uh, globes of, of her eyes. In 1956, an ophthalmologist using an ophthalmoscope. You know, you get your eyes checked, they have that deal, you put your chin on it, your forehead, and they have the needle, you think they're going to poke you in the eye. Well, when they did that to this image, he, he actually started talking. Can you move to the left? He forgot it was an image. The eyes, when you have eyes, when you see, one sees something different than the other, and your brain processes it. In this image, the eyes act just like human eyes when the doctors are looking at it. <coughs> Miracles. Well, of course, the image itself. When they built, they had a big parade, and they had a big celebration when they built the uh, the chapel in two weeks. 
And during it, an arrow came, they were shooting arrows in the air, and one came down and killed one of the, one of the dancers. And they brought the dancer to the bishop and laid him on the ground in front of Our Lady, and he was completely healed and came back to life. Right in front of the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe. Plagues have been stopped when children prayed in the image. In the Battle of Lepanto, where we did the rosary, remember, they, we, the, they had the big Battle of Lepanto? The image of Our Lady was on the flagship. Don Juan, who was the admiral in charge of everything, was 24 years old. It was two to one odds that twice as many boats, twice as many ships that were from Islam coming up. And yet, the winds, they were in the crescent moon, ours were in the form of a cross, and the winds confused them, and we were able to win the battle. Uh, in 19, 1629, there was a flood that inundated, and a sister came out of her house, and she sees Our Lady holding up this wall of water, and she says, Blessed Mother, why would your son allow so many people to die? And the Blessed Mother said, If I were not here to protect you, many more would die for what they're doing to my son. She intervenes for us. The plague that killed 700,000 decided when she was proclaimed the patroness of Mexico. Father Lopez in the 1700s goes and he says, I got I, we have to have a mass. So he goes to Rome, he gets the best energy he can get, he goes to Rome and he brings it to the Pope. And he says, we gotta have a mass, there's no mass for Our Lady Guadalupe. And so Pope says he'll write the mass that night when he hears the story, he was so impressed. He comes back the next day, he gets the mass, he says, now bring it over to the administration building. And when he gets there, they say, you need all the paperwork. Oh, how do I start that? No, it's already done, you just gotta find it. Well, he couldn't find it. And he's all over Rome checking all the libraries, the churches, and finally he does a novena to Our Lady Guadalupe, and on the, twelfth, on the ninth day of the novena, by the way, do you know why we do nine days for novena? It's the nine days that they waited from the ascension to the time the Holy Spirit came on Pentecost. They prayed in the upper room for nine days, waiting for Pentecost. That's why we do novenas that are nine days. These are things that we should know so we can share with people and say, well, why do you do these things, right? That's one of them. So, so they prayed, he prayed in a and on the ninth day, this peddler was trying to sell him stuff and he's all upset and tells him to get lost. And finally, he kept begging and so he gives him a coin, he takes a book. And when he gets home to his room that night, the book was all of the paperwork. And the mass that they did is the mass that we celebrate in two days. Same mass. In 1791, they were cleaning the frame and they spilled nitric acid. And if you look, all you can see is the watermark from the nitric acid not destroy the image at all. If it was a better look sometimes at the group of this. She's so beautiful. In November of 1921, a bomb with 19 sticks of dynamite were put in a flower arrangement because the Mexican government wanted to eliminate Christianity and they didn't have the guts to do anything in the basilica. So they said, if we just blow it up, it'll be done. Well, it exploded right during Mass, and it was between the bishop on the altar and the lady's image, right? The crucifix on the altar and the lady's image on the wall. And no one was hurt. Glass was broken three football fields away from the explosion. Marble was broken off the walls. The altar was broken on the edges. Not a person at the Mass was injured. The image was uncut. All of the power was absorbed by the cross. Our Lord, as usual, takes it upon himself the damage that we do. Very thick, very heavy. The Basilica housing the image, we talked about it was being built on water. Remember there was all that water and they used lava rock to fill it up? Well, things were sinking and the Basilica was actually starting to tilt. And when they built the new basilica and moved the image over, from that day on it stopped tilting. And now it's perpetually bowed towards the new basilica, where she's housed. You can see it tilting here. See how this is the new basilica? See how that, that's not the picture, that's actually the tilting of the basilica. She's very good. So what are we called to do? We're called 
to evangelize. We're called to take upon us that which he asks of us. Just like she takes upon what God asked of her. She had her fiat. She wants from us our fiat. How do you, how do, you do that? What do we do? Just share it. Just share the story. Share the story. Live a good life. Let people see. Be ready to defend your faith. Go to Bible study. Come to these things. This is the, the CIA doing it. This is so spectacular that they're putting the effort and doing so many of these things for you to learn so that you're prepared to do what Peter says in, in 1 Peter 3.15. Always be prepared to explain the reason for your hope. Explain your faith. I want to end in a quick prayer. Dear Jesus, you have sent us each on our way, on the pilgrim way of life. Grant us faith for believing in you and seeing you in the people and circumstances we encounter each day. Grant us hope in the knowledge that you and your Blessed Mother are at our side each step of the way. Grant us charity so that we may be a light to others on the journey which leads us closer to you in love. In your great mercy, forgive our sins. Help us to accept the many gifts, great and small, along the way. This we pray with Mary as our guide. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, the Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and in the hour of our death. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you for coming. It was really great.